need to provide political content. I've led the, the Young Communist League, I've led the South African Communist Party. Quite frankly, I've led the ANC before leading the ANC Youth League, I've led the SACP before leading the YCF. <laughs> so, my approach today, although I'm not dressed in red, is going to be primarily red and communist or socialist in nature. I'm going to try and take Marx's approach on the nature of imperialism and the rise of capitalism and what it represents for an economy that's confused like South Africa's economy because we are a mixed economic system. It means we accommodate both communist ideas when we see it fit and we are embracing of capitalist ideas and natures where we see it fit. We fit the same economy, and that's why I'm saying I'm going to take a red approach on this topic. The theme today, I'm going to try and be quick today so that we don't uh, spend too much time so that the future comrades don't avoid coming to sessions uh, thinking that it will take too much of their time out of their academic uh, schedules. Uh, Minister, uh, District uh, Executive Member of the YCN, uh, political lectures must be like this. If they become many, they start either becoming factional and getting out of hand and no longer becoming just about political lectures. So the branch decided they want to speak on the issue of fourth industrial revolution and the impact, the compromises it might have on the economy. And we're going to focus that on the economy of South Africa, or primarily economies of peripheries of third world countries. In the last political lecture organized by SASCO, we tried to touch on the issue of fourth industrial revolution. But I'm going to briefly highlight again what entails, what is this popular phrase that we have been using in and out of context? That is the fourth industrial revolution. And in order to achieve that, we need to have first a background analysis of why are we saying, why is there sudden mimics of the fourth industrial revolution, whereas we have not had any popularity of the other revolutions that have existed before. Because if we are in the fourth industrial revolution, surely there was a third, second, and a first industrial revolution. And in order to answer the question of what are the impacts of the fourth industrial revolution on the South African economy, we need to understand why there are industrial revolutions in the first place. So what is, a, what is an industrial revolution? Without looking at the phases that they have taken, we know what a revolution is. Since we are, I'm assuming that we know what a revolution is, since we are in a communist setup. It's a relay either of political or ideological concepts and evolution, how they develop over time, how they change over time. So when comrades during the apartheid government were saying they are in a revolution, they meant that they are in a race intending to change the structures or the system of apartheid to that of an inclusive, democratic, non-sexist, non-racial dispensation. So an industrial revolution speaks of the change, development and evolution within the industry itself. The development over time of those industries. Perhaps the 
where the industry might be a bit broad, but we are speaking specifically of the production industries. So forget the other industries. The industrial revolution is primarily focused on the production industry. Production or manufacturing. Depends on what you want to tell me. So let me give you a brief, a brief background of how far we have come in terms of the industrial revolution thus far. So, initially everything was produced with hands by individuals or by labor, right? That would be the inception of everything. Everything was produced, everything that you see, every equipment would have been produced by individuals themselves using their own bare hands. The first industrial revolution, therefore, is a shift from that primitive industrial production or industrial system of production to introduce machinery within the factories and manufacturing industries to enable producers to produce more because we, are, we will be well aware that production with machines would in most instances, enhance the amount of output that you can come out with as compared to production done with hands. But because this was the inception or the starting point of machine, machines being introduced within the manufacturing industries, these machines were in the first industrial revolution which started towards the end of the 18th century, the end of the century, around your 1784s, would mean production using steam machinery, whether using the power of coal or any other elements that could steam, including water or hydroelectricity. What is particularly important in that first industrial revolution, relevant to the question that this political lecture must answer, is that this started, or the introduction of machines started in Britain, or in the British Empire at that point. And Britain, in order to maximize its own output and profit, restricted skilled laborers, restricted producers of machines, restricted machines themselves, only to the confines of the British Empire. As in, they didn't want anyone else outside Britain to have those machines, to have the knowledge of operating those machines, to even have people to sell those machines for them. We go over time, of course, uh, when people see opportunity, they will run away and go open stores and go open a spaza shop to sell machines elsewhere. And bit by bit, the monopoly of Britain over the first industrial revolution collapsed to be inclusive of other European states. The second industrial revolution comes, which entails primarily the use of bigger machinery and the introduction of electricity in the production of those, or in the, in the, in the operation of those machines. Mind you, now we're moving from coal and hydroelectricity to electricity, as we know it today. <coughs> that means more energy, more firepower means more production capacity, means more output. And both mean more profit. With time, of course, your Ford in 1913 would introduce such 
uh, multi-production multi, um, um, systems to be able to produce more cars than any other uh, manufacturer had been able to do before. But what becomes important before now on this famous or infamous fourth industrial revolution was the introduction of computerized or computer or IT programmed machinery around your 1974s. Which means that's where the inception of a third industrial revolution came in. Whether it's your cashier machines, anything that wanted an operation of IBM or the use of any IT programming system. But what is important is that even with the advancement of this IT programming and IT systems, the necessity to have labor to operate those machines from the first industrial revolution to the third industrial revolution was inevitable. So no matter how much machinery you had, <coughs> there needed to be human beings on site, there needed to be labor on site to operate these particular machines. But the difference in the three stages is that with one coming the other, it would mean a reduction in the necessity or the amount of labor required to operate or to produce in any industry. So now we are here in the fourth industrial revolution. And I'm sure you've already heard what the fourth industrial revolution entails. Artificial intelligence, robotics. We're all familiar with what the fourth industrial revolution comes with and to. Then the importance of making or providing a critique on the implications of the fourth industrial revolution, particularly from a communist point of view, is remember what we said the whole industrial revolution from first stage to fourth stage has been about. It has been about maximizing production, maximizing output, and as a result, maximizing profit. So it would not be too premature to borrow or to assume that what Marx or Karl Marx and Frederick Engel in their Communist Manifesto warned as the coming of the highest form of imperialism <coughs> or capitalism is going to arrive through the fourth industrial revolution. That means the capitalist or the bourgeoisie or the owners of the means of production now can produce without that one means of production that most black people or people in third world countries own, which is labor. The fourth industrial revolution, unlike the rest of the other three, has that capacity to wipe out the necessity or the importance of labor within the production industry or manufacturing industry. I don't know if we're still together after this one. So now the question remains, if we have got something with the capacity to erode the importance of labor, remember, there are about five primary factors of production, so means of production. It's 
labor, I mean it's land, it's entrepreneurship, it's capital, it's uh, technology or blah blah blah, and labor. Right? Most of the third world countries or individuals found within the third world countries are in possession of just this alone. The only bargaining in power, the only form of negotiation you have, or the only contribution you have in the system. You don't have capital, it's owned by the bourgeoisie, you don't have well, entrepreneurship, some we try, but you don't have necessary capital to enhance our entrepreneurship skills. Sadly, we don't even have land, even though we're in the continent of our own. We don't have the necessary capacity or advanced technology as compared to the rest. So, we're saying the fourth industrial revolution will make it possible for production to take place with only the four, without the fifth one, which is the only one which we own. I don't know if from that alone you are already picking up the intensity of the implications that this must have, not just on the economy, but even to the human beings themselves. Imagine the day the mind says, we are tired of you doing, doing. we are tired of you asking for your uh, pay raise, we are tired of you using <coughs> bargaining powers that you have through your unions to dictate how much you want to be paid. We are going to employ robotics in the mines. And all of you contractors, all of you miners, with your reflective workers must come out and add up to the already high stakes of unemployment rate. Why should this be so scary for a third world economy? You see, Marx wants of the existing development disparities between the core and the periphery in that at all times when countries which are highly industrialized which are the core or which are at the center of production have relations with countries that are, are far from the center of production or at the periphery of production, the nature of that relationship is inherently exploitative. In that whatever form of development the one in the periphery will get, you must know that the one in the center is getting 10 times that. He explicitly uses, they explicitly use the words, the rich continues to get richer, while the poor will continue to be poor. I'm sure you're familiar with that phrase. So, who's going to be feeding fourth industrial revolution? Who's going to be feeding this artificial intelligence? We understand that Dr. Chifula of uh, the University of Pretoria was one of the first in the world to perform an inner ear transplant using a 3D printed um, 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 particle or ear or cell. Something worth celebrating. But the question still remains, even if that was to be rolled out, how many of us would have the capacity to afford that transplant. How many people have died of heart diseases, heart attacks? 
how many wealthy people have met, multiples of hearts changed in there. Whenever they feel that this one is no longer pumping right, or I've taken too much, it's now, it can't cope anymore, they go change. It's particularly scary for South Africa because one of our basic forms of generating revenue in South Africa remains taxation. So when you wipe out the labor, which becomes, which is one of the primary generating sources of income for SARS. Where do we then get that smaller injection that came out, that comes out of the taxation, income tax of the labors within the confines of the South African economy? It means now we're going to have a leakage of sources or resources in the economy. The same resources that are used for your service delivery, for your basic needs, day in and day out. But that should not be the most scary part and the biggest implication to the economy. You see, General economics dictate that, you see, apart from labor being useful for purposes of production, the capitalists or the bourgeoisies who are the owners of this industries must not lie. The purpose of labor is not merely just production alone and it ends there. The purpose of labor of, or of being able to provide labor with an opportunity to work, employability, and giving them resources is so that they in turn be able to consume from the production of the industry. That means if there's no money being earned, there's no money being spent. Are we clear? If people are no longer working, then whatever is being produced, regardless of how simple, how, in what amount of output it will be produced, there will be no one to buy from the economy because no one will be having the money to spend within the economy itself. General economics will tell you the introduction of machinery introduces what we call structural unemployment, right? But the result of that structural unemployment will result in what we call a cyclical unemployment. Let me give a general Jack and Jim explanation of what cyclical unemployment in context and relevance to the introduction of fourth industrial revolution and the wiping out or erosion of the importance of labor within the economy means. If the only source of the economy in South Africa is SASCO, the baker, right? And SASCO produces a hundred loaves a day for whoever is there within that population of the economy. And the hundred loaves can be produced by ten people. It means each person produces how many? Ten loaves a day. At a point where SASCO will realize that hundred loaves are no longer being consumed a day. Only 80 loaves are being consumed a day. It means they have a loss, or they are running at a loss of 20 loaves a day. So cutting the production of 20 
cutting knows a day means what? Cutting two people who are producing those 20 loaves a day. But the complexity of the issue is the fact that those two people contributed to five loaves being bought each. Because as the only employees within the economy, they were even buying for their relatives. Everyone was depending on them. So two people are out, it means 10 loaves, 10 feather loaves within a short space of time will be useless. It means within a short space of time, Sasko must retrench a feather one person because now only 70 loaves are being consumed. Continuously, the cycle runs and runs until the economy dwindles to become nothing but just a symbol that there was once an operative, a constructive economy within that particular system. So as we stand, of course others may raise questions of what are their prospects for countries in the third world to partake, participate, or even compete within the setup of the fourth industrial revolution. And the answer will remain, even if we were to participate, even if we were to compete, it will be for the benefit of the 1%, which is the rich. So now, the question remains, what is this fuzz about the fourth industrial revolution? And should we, as third world countries, be running after well-industrialized, well-developed countries in pursuit of the fourth industrial revolution? Or is ours? Because when you, when you, are, you see, fortunate enough for South Africa, latest statistics have said we are at somewhere around 95% electrified in the whole country. Like electricity has been installed all around the country, up to at least around 95% of the households that exist. But in other countries, in Africa, uh, the 5% is the one that enjoys electricity. And the rest of the 95 is still in shadows. Even in countries that are well better electrified, lately in Zimbabwe they were having at least electricity for six hours in the 24 hours of a day. You were complaining about load shedding of two hours a day. They have electricity for six hours and a shutdown for the rest of the 80. I mention that because it shows how far back <coughs> other countries in the third world are in terms of their pursuit of the second industrial revolution which is electrification. So now our sudden rise or interest in the fourth industrial revolution without even completely going through the rest of the other industrial revolutions must scare us. Here is a child after adolescent 
when they start realizing that they have different types of hair growing, then when they hear people say, I want to marry, they say, I want to marry. <laughs> you have not even started dating. You have not even been heartbroken. But because of the pursuit of those who are well in front of you, you want to run there as well. Because seemingly, that's where everyone is running. The introduction of the fourth industrial revolution, even in our pursuit, because technology plays a role, and the advancement of technology plays a role, a, play, a huge role, in the status of a country within the context of international relations. Whether countries will take you serious or they will take you lightly may come out of how well advanced are you in terms of innovation and technology. And some of the problems that exist in our societies, of course, may require technology or technological innovations or the advancement of what we already have in terms of technology. But a complete pursuit of the fourth industrial revolution will not only harm the South African economy, but has got capacity to crumble it to the ground over time. Are we clear, Mr. Kavad? So, in a nutshell, in summer, we have traveled a long way in terms of how industries pursue the maximization of their profit. But the history of the Industrial Revolution has shown that the pursuit of advanced production mechanisms have not been in the interest of the labor, in the interest of the pro proletariat, in the interest of the people, in the interest of the economy where such industrial production takes place, but has always been in the interest of those who are the owners of capital of those at the center of production. So the nature of the industrial revolution from the first phase to the now has shown <coughs> us that the industrial revolution has been about nothing but a pure form of capitalism. Of course, when the liberals want to fool people with the idea of capitalism, they say we are, capitalism gives everyone an opportunity to become millionaires or to pursue their own interests and be able to accumulate as much as they want, unlike the restrictions that may seemingly be visible within a socialist setup. But we tell you, there is no equal opportunity, there is no equal footing. It's all a lie. Mm. Even things as minor as tenders, which were conceived from an idea of emancipating those who were previously disadvantaged, are still being exploited and they are going to the rich. Because you, you must pay a bribe to get a tender. When you get a tender of 100,000 cash in order to get a, a, a tender uh, for, for 3 million. If it's not the fact that you have that money, it must be the fact that you are within the closest proximity of the elite group. And even then, even though you are in the closest proximity of those in charge, 
It doesn't guarantee that you are going to be given. So, as a result, the future of our economy in light of the introduction of the fourth industrial revolution is not certain. It is not going to... There are those, of course, whose economies are most likely going to be are most likely going to be empowered by the introduction of the fourth industrial revolution. But I tell you, those whose economies are most likely going to be empowered by this fourth industrial revolution are not us. And surely, it is not South Africa. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that those who want to be innovative, those who are doing IT, those who are not saying you must be restricted from your innovations. But your innovations will not in any harm if pursued as a national agenda benefit the economy as a whole. As a matter of fact, there is going to be less and less development, less and less growth in the economy to a point where our economy will come down to its knees. I said I'm not going to prolong my lecture. But the topic is very interesting, and since it's still new, it requires that comrades must look at it from an objective point of view, so that we don't find, of course we don't want to find ourselves left behind, but we don't want to find ourselves drowning because we were trying to fit in or go with the flow. You can't go with the flow when you know that you can't swim. You are either going to be a victim of drowning within the same system that you will be trying to go with the flow in, or in the presence of bigger fishes like sharks. I am not referring to a certain uh, <laughs> But you will find yourself seriously dealt with by the element of such an animal that I have uh, mentioned. <laughs> so, comrades, we can, in light of that brief uh, lecture, we can have an interaction, uh, be it questions, be it comments, be it an extension, be it an observation. Remember, these are political spaces. You would not be wrong to differ. Within political spaces, you would not be wrong to, because politics are all about disagreeing to agree, or agreeing to disagree, in that if we fail to have an agreement at the end of the conversation, we must just agree that we're going to continuously disagree. But in cases where we can convince each other, we will be able to reach agreements after our disagreements. So, comrades, we can open uh, in that uh, fashion a set of hands that either wants to comment, that either wants to add, or that wants to interrogate, or wants to have a different light. Perhaps other people have got a different observation. Uh, I'm seeing two hands. <laughs>